I've been avoiding doing this video all day because I just don't feel like I'm going to do it justice, but I'm just going to do it because God always comes through. So I recently, in the last couple days, was talking with someone I love very much who is discerning the times and discerning certain things, uh, including whether or not I am a witness, as I have claimed. And one of the things he was telling me is I feel this in my heart. And I want you guys to understand that God is going to give you a clear witness. In fact, in his law, he says that he will give you two or more witnesses in order to establish a matter or, or confirm or in order to expose something for being false, which is also a confirmation, right? It's a confirmation that this is false or that this is true. So talking about things in terms of like a feeling in your heart can be deceptive when you're trying to learn how to hear from God and what God's pattern is. And one thing that he taught me early on when I thought that I was hearing certain things from him or I was indeed hearing things from him, but I was interpreting it incorrectly. What he taught me is if you think that you're hearing something from me, I am going to show you in my word whether or not that thing is true. I'm always going to give you two witnesses, my spirit and my word. It doesn't mean that he's not going to give you a third witness or a fourth or a fifth or a sixth, but he will always give you two witnesses. So what I want to tell you is that if you think that you're hearing something from God, it is not testing the Lord to ask him to give you another witness. It's actually holding him to his law. So it is perfectly acceptable and actually it is correct to go back and tell him, look, I, am I think I'm hearing this from you. And I ask you for your second witness. The first being your spirit, the second being your word. And the other thing that I want you to know is that God is not going to leave you hanging. So it's not, he's not going to answer you by not answering you. And what I mean by that is people will say things. I've heard people say things like, well, I asked God about this and he didn't answer me. Therefore, it must not be true or it must be true. No, that's not the way that God works. God says, he tells you in his word that if you are asking for wisdom, he will give it to you freely without finding fault. But you have to believe that he's going to give it to you. And so here's the thing is that a lot of times what people do is if they're not hearing from him, they'll say, well, I guess it's not true or I guess it's true. And they'll just make a decision based on their carnality as to what God's answer is. I'm here to tell you guys that God will answer you, but he's also going to test you. So if you don't believe in him, then you're going to do the things that others do, such as making a decision carnally, or you're not going to go back to him. Now, if I ask God a question and he does not answer me, and I've told you this many times on various videos, if he does not answer me, I bug him until he does. I will continue to bug him until he answers me because I believe in him. I believe in his promises. I believe in his law. And I know from experience, he will answer me. Now, there are also times when he's not answering me because there's work that I need to do. And that's something that each and every one of us has to discern. If we've asked him something and he's not responding, there's work that we need to do. So let me give you an example of this. If there's something that you're discerning and you have certain information, you do need to go to his word and you need to make your, you need to educate yourself regarding what his word says. So for example, this person who I was speaking with, they've seen certain things in my life. In fact, they have seen me since before God, before Christ even drew me to himself. They saw me when I was a very worldly woman of great wealth very spiritually, physically, and emotionally sick. And they saw me from the time that Christ drew me to himself until now. They've seen God restore me, but they've also seen God bring me low and strip all of that filth off of me. That filth that, by the way, in the world, our flesh thinks that that's beautiful. We think it looks so nice. Oh, it's so good. Wow, you know, this person is so attractive. They're so glamorous. They're so fashionable. And the world is blinded by these things. I'm watching the, you know, little snippets of the DNC and I'm like, yeah, 
people are all pumped up and and it, it denying common sense because what what they're being presented with appeals to their flesh which is another reason why i do not do live videos because you don't need to decide whether you want to accept the message whether uh, by whether i look good to you look good to your flesh or not and i would say that 99 probably more percent of people on youtube that's the basis for their decision they're not making the, their decision based on the holy spirit and what the holy spirit is is uh, administering to them they're making their decision on whether or not the person speaking is shiny enough well i'm gonna tell you right now i'm not shiny i was very shiny at one time <laughs> i am not shiny anymore god has brought me very low and there's nothing more biblical than that guys he's going to bring you low if you're going to serve him you're going to have to be low okay getting back to my point my point is that this person has seen my lived testimony. They, they are part of my family. They've known me for a long time. They have seen the transformation. And not all of the transformation, in fact, a lot of the transformation is not pretty. If they saw me, you know, I, I think that in the world, like if, if someone sees you coming out of a tent and then you become wealthy, which actually is part of my story. I lived on the street in a tent at one time. And I got my doctorate and I built three businesses and I became incredibly wealthy. And then I became poor again, not because God took it from me, but because he asked me what was going to be my decision. And I made the decision to give up my wealth. But I'll tell you this, going from being in a tent to having incredible wealth, everyone wants that. Everybody looks at that. I mean, I can't tell you how many people came out of the woodwork who were so terrible to me when I was living in a tent and a big old loser to when I purchased a house and then I purchased a building. Oh, they were so proud of me. Oh, they wanted what I had. I was shiny. But see, when you go from being wealthy to choosing to give up your wealth in order to serve God, that's not so shiny here, is it? People don't want it. Don't let your flesh deceive you. What you need to do is you need to look at what the testimony is, look at what the word says, listen to God's spirit, and you need to do your homework and go to God and ask him, all right, here is the information that I have, and you sort it through with him because you are required to do personal accountability work. Here's what I've seen in Carrie Ann. I know better than most people where she comes from. I know better than most people the family she came from, I know that she lived on the street. I know that she got a doctorate, built three businesses, and had incredible wealth. I saw her when she was crazy and on the brink of death. We all thought she was going to die, and indeed, she was dying. And I have seen her come to life spiritually, physically. She might not look that pretty. She might have been brought down by God, brought into loneliness and humility not getting her hair and her nails done and everything looking so nice and wearing expensive clothes and shoes and handbags like she did at one time. And I saw her make that choice herself. Nothing happened that it was taken away from her. I saw that she made that choice herself with God, that she chose this, even to the point of choosing to give up her career and lose her property even to the point of giving her shoes, her handbags, her clothes, and making herself so lowly that she gives everything away for free every single day at her own cost and without charge to anyone. I watched that. Now, what does the word say? The word says that that's what we need to do. The word says that we suffer for Christ, that we are not worldly, that we are dressed in the righteous acts of God's people, that the witnesses are dressed in sackcloth and ashes, which is a metaphor for grief. The word says that these are prophets. Does her, is her teaching consistent with the word or is there falsehood in her teaching? Does she speak on her own authority for her own glory or does she speak for the glory of God? Does she speak on his authority? Is God testifying to the things that she has said, to the things that she has taught? If, because if indeed she's a witness, then these end times that are taught in Revelation and in Daniel, and in Isaiah, and in Ezekiel, and in Jeremiah, all of these things, we should be able to see that the everything that the prophets have pointed to regarding these end times should be happening, shouldn't they? 
And is Carrie Ann able to point that out? Does she point it out? Does she show us, look, this is what I've taught you. Now this is what it's looking like right now in the world. There are very specific things that have to happen in the last seven years before Christ comes. Seven years plus 45 days before Christ comes. Very specific things that have to happen. There has to be a covenant with the Antichrist. The witnesses have to testify for 1260 days. Then the beast rises from the abyss to overpower and kill those witnesses. And in fact, Revelation 13 tells us that it's the image of the beast that counterfeit religion, the Antichrist, is worshiping that is going to overpower and kill the witnesses and is going to require all whose names, all of the inhabitants of the earth, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's Book of Life to worship this beast and receive its mark. And at this point in history, it don't matter if you're a Republican, if you are a Democrat, everyone's worshiping the image of this beast, this counterfeit Israel. They have all been bought. And we're a year away from that Antichrist, that image of the Antichrist, the Antichrist rising from the abyss to overpower and kill the witnesses. And yet already we can see that the very image of the Antichrist, counterfeit Israel, is already forcing people to speak its ideologies or shut up or be imprisoned and some of them killed. It is already forcing people to worship this image of the beast or be killed. Maybe not the entire inhabitants of the earth, but it's doing it with some of them, isn't it? Because Palestinians who won't leave their land and will not submit to this image of the beast, they're being killed. Here in the false prophet of the United States, that also, by the way, I've taught you, created this image of the beast, here in the United States, you cannot speak against Israel without consequences. And Israel, through the ADL, through APAC, through Netanyahu, is directing our legislation and our elected officials. Why do they have any influence over removing members of Congress? Because you realize they're doing that. And why is it that people are being fired over criticisms of another nation? We're not even in that nation. Why are we being fired over criticisms of another nation? Or why are journalists who are supposed to have who have the credentials for being able to speak certain things and certain should be having certain immunity to be able to exercise free speech in the press. Why are they being arrested here in the U.S., in Europe, and in Israel? Well, we've talked about this. I've taught you that the 10 kings or kingdoms are those 10 Germanic tribes that became Western Europe. The 10 kings, the 10 horns, that the Antichrist is wearing. I have told you that those 10 kings are going to receive power as is written in Revelation 17, that they will receive power for one hour along with the beast. Hello, NATO will receive power and their one purpose is to hand over power and authority to the beast. I have told you that there are two purposes to the false prophet who in Revelation 17, we are told that this false prophet of the United States, the seventh kingdom, has two purposes that are written about in Revelation 13. One, to testify to the Antichrist. Two, to create the image of the beast, to give breath to and power to the image of the beast. Have they done it? And that that seventh kingdom is going to fall to the eighth kingdom, which is the Antichrist. Hello, is the United States at this point falling? The United States really if you understand the position that we're in financially, economically, and with regard to other nations, we are not a global superpower. We have fallen. And these are just basic facts, guys. These are basic facts in the word of God that when these things happen, you're supposed to know where we're at in history. You're supposed to know that when the, when the United States, the seventh kingdom falls, that the Antichrist is going to rise and that it will fall to the Antichrist. Let me tell you the eight, king, eight kingdoms. Number one, how do we know what number one is? Because in Daniel 2, we're told what number one is. Number one is Babylon. Very simple countdown. All you got to do is follow history. Who did Babylon fall to? Babylon fell to Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia fell to Greece. Greece fell to pagan Rome. Pagan Rome fell to papal Rome. That's your fifth kingdom. 
That is the Antichrist, which was, now is not, but is going to rise again to be the eighth kingdom. So starting from pagan, excuse me, papal Rome, the fifth kingdom of the Antichrist with the 10 toes, the prostitutes that bore out of her, Revelation 17 tells us that this is a mother. She is Babylon the Great, the mother of all prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. A prostitute is one that, a church that prostitutes itself to the world. That's why you're looking at these churches and you're going, no one's speaking truth. What's going on here? Because they are the prostitutes. John 4 told you to worship in the spirit and in truth, not in a temple. If not in a temple, then not in a cathedral, guys. Not in a mega church, not where someone's telling you to pay tithing so that they can get rich off of making God a marketplace. Jesus th flipped over the tables over this issue of making God, his father, his father's house, a marketplace. What is this abomination that people are calling churches today? The early church didn't have a place to meet. They were being persecuted and killed just like the, just like we will be. And by the way, if you haven't been persecuted and killed and suffered for Christ, you're not going up in the first resurrection. That's already been told to you in scripture. So if you don't believe that, it's because you reject it. It's not because that information's not available to you. If you see that this seventh kingdom, so, so you have the fifth kingdom, the Antichrist, that, that started counterfeit Christianity. The kingdom of the Antichrist started the kingdom of counterfeit Christianity, the Babylon the Great, and the prostitutes that bore out of her. Catholicism, papal Rome, fell to atheistic communism, Communism fell to the United States. That's the seventh kingdom. There's no one else that's get, that came after the Antichrist that's, that's going to testify to it, is there? Communism that took it down isn't going to testify to it. The United States is testifying to it. And then the eighth king, kingdom will rise again because the seventh kingdom helped facilitate its rise. All right, so I've told you all these things. I have set an example and lived a testimony out in front of you. You have this information in the word. I have shown you and taught you the information in the word. I have shown you what it looks like in the world right now to prove to you that I am doing what I'm doing at this point and to prove to you that we are at this point in history and that all of these things add up. And I have been saying it for at least three years. So you tell me, could I three years ago have predicted that all of this was going to happen? I simply told you what I was doing and I simply told you what God was revealing to me over the last three years and everything, the chips have fallen exactly where they were supposed to fall in order for these things to be fulfilled. So this is your homework. This is your part of what needs to happen is that you look at those things and you bring them to God and you say, okay, these are the things I know of your word. This is what I'm seeing in her behavior in her lived testimony, it all adds up, Lord. Or here's where, here's where, what I don't know about. Here's what I'm unsure about. And you sit with him and you ask him, is this true or not? And if it's true, then confirm for me. And if it's not, then expose Carrie Ann for being false. If she is false, expose it. Do you think I'm afraid to tell you that? I'm not afraid in the least. And I believe in God with all my heart. And I know that if I'm false, that God will expose it. Because I know that if I'm doing something in his name, and if I am found a liar to have taken any of this for myself, he will expose it. I know that my conscience is clean, and I know what it is that I am doing. What I ask of you is to ask him what I'm doing. You ask him to give you those two witnesses by his spirit and his truth. His spirit is going to convict you. But you need to know that that's not just coming from you. You need to know that that's not your preference. That's not your voice. That's not your thoughts, your carnal interpretation or understanding. You need to know that what you are feeling and hearing is truly coming from his spirit. And that's why he gives you a second witness. He will show you. He will make it so clear to you. So you ask him. You present what you know doing your personal accountability work because you can't just say, oh, God's not answering me. If he's not answering you, then it's probably because you haven't done your homework. You haven't gone to him 
and said, okay, here's what I know of your word and really sorted it out with him. You're just asking him to food, spoon feed you. And God doesn't do things that way. There needs to be personal accountability for collecting the information that he has given you, knowing the information that he has given you and comparing that with what you're seeing. And so then you go to him and you ask him for at least two witnesses. He may give you three, four, five, six, but he will at least give you two. I'm making this part one of a series, and I think that there will only be two unless God moves me to do more. But in the second video, I'm going to be talking about my testimony and what it is that, that God has done with me. From the very beginning, when he first started talking to me and tore me down to the brink of death, still had my wealth. I mean, what good is your wealth if you're dying? you are like, got one foot on a banana peel and one foot in the grave. What good is any of that? I, I wasn't living the high life. I was in bed 22 hours a day, puking on myself and not even able to clean up my puke, having to put a towel over my puke just so that I could step over it to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Okay, I don't mean to be disgusting, but I'm letting you know that was my life with incredible wealth, nice clothes in my closet, couldn't even wear them because I couldn't get up to get long enough to get them on and go somewhere. What good is any of it? I'm going to be sharing with you my testimony, where it is that God brought me and the process of him restoring me so that I would teach transgressors his ways, so that I could become a servant to him instead of the world and self as I was living before. So I will do that video. That's really the video that I'm a little bit nervous about. I, I You know, God always brings me to a place where He's the one speaking the message through me. He's the one or through my repertoire and, and leading me and helping me to speak in a palatable way. I just, I don't know. It's a, it's a, my testimony is a very precious thing to me because it's what God has done. And I want to do justice to him. But you know what? I think time and time again, the thing is that there's really nothing that I can give to God except for being a willing vessel. So as long as I'm willing to share my testimony, even though I'm not eloquent, and I don't know how necessarily to express it, he will make it happen. Because if my testimony is truly from him, he's the one who wants to share it. It's his light that's going to shine for the rest of the world, right? He said, I didn't give you light to put it under a bowl. I gave you a light to put it on a lampstand. And my testimony is that lampstand. He's going to testify to it by placing his light on it to shine for the rest of the world. That's what it means to be the light of the world. It's not our light. It's his light shining through us and through the testimony that we share it as witnesses. You may not be the two, one of the two witnesses or the 144,000 more accurately, but you are a witness if you're in him. So all of us have to be built. All right, I will do that video now. Please discern this message with God. Please make sure that you know that I'm from him. And if you don't know that I'm from him, you need to go discern that before you continue to listen to me or anyone else for that matter. This is extremely important because if you're listening to someone you have not discerned with God, that person is an idol in your life. That's what you have set them up to be. You haven't set God first. You haven't gone to him and, and uh, asked him to direct your paths. You're just sort of being led by your own carnal desires. Oh, this person looks shiny. Let me listen to them. Let me see what they have to say. Oh, this person, well, I like some of the things that they say, right? Like that's such a common thing in counterfeit Christianity. Well, I take what I like and I leave the rest. Uh, that's called selective, like selective preference. But the word says that a person is either a person of truth or a person of falsehood. They can't be both. A person can make mistakes and then you, can, you ask them, hey, it says this in the Bible. And then you watch their behavior and see if they correct themselves and if they actually have a desire for truth or if they're going to try to defend themselves. So I'm not talking about making mistakes or being corrected. But ultimately, a person is either a person of truth or a person of falsehood. And you have to discern that fruit. And then you bring that fruit to God and you say, you know what? It seems like this person is speaking truth. Is this someone you'd like me to listen to? And you let him let you know. And I can tell you right now, I've done that so many times and he's he has exposed so many times because he told me very early on when he was teaching me his word that no one was speaking truth. But I had this idea in my head that I needed to go collect information 
you know, through Google and sermons and blah, blah, blah. But he, he taught me. He taught me personally that I was not to listen to anybody. And so eventually when he allowed me to listen to certain things, I never listened to sermons. That I can tell you 100%. I do not listen to sermons, commentaries. I don't listen to people tell me about God because God tells me about God. But he, he does allow me now to go and listen to current events. And so that's what I end up discerning is like, is this person speaking truth? And I do my homework to see, okay, is this, um, is this actually being reported elsewhere? Or is it something they made up? So now that he has me do that, I know how to discern. But I'll tell you, as, star as far as sermons and commentaries and talking about God, talking about scripture, I don't listen to anybody, no one. But I had to be taught that and I resisted it. All right, I'll share more about that in the next video. I don't want to get into it in this video, but please do discern this with God.